SaaS, right? We're, we're talking about subscription-like industries. Mm. Sometimes it's not necessarily conversion rate optimization. Mm. And where we can use optimization techniques is actually around things like retention and churn. Consumers mm. and customers of our clients are interacting with brands in more ways than ever before. So whether that be across their website or it be on their app, could be email, SMS, push notifications. Mm. Where are those areas where we can really intercept and optimize that messaging and that strategy to ensure that we're driving impact? For anyone who doesn't know, um, there is obviously a big trend growing around this cookie-less future. I think it's one of the best things that, that's happening to this industry, although it's getting harder for us to be able to do some of the te techniques and tactics we've been relying on for a long time in digital marketing. But in mm. saying that, it's giving the power back to the people. It's giving people the opportunity to decide when they want to opt in or consent. It's really, really important. When I speak to leadership qualities, it's not just myself as a leader in my team, but yeah. how do I empower every person in the team, no matter how junior they are, to really focus on their own leadership qualities, to manage upwards and make sure that people understand that, hey, I'm a voice and I'm important yeah. here as well. AI will replace a lot of the mundane, tedious tasks that yeah. teams do. Um, I think I'm really excited for AI to be able to take away from the, the, the low effort work and give people the flexibility to really focus on the bigger things that matter and where more brain power is needed. Welcome to another episode of the CRO Wizard series by VWO Podcast. In this series, we speak to top CRO leaders in e-commerce, media, subscription, retail, banking, and other industries about CRO strategies and the positive impact they can have on your business. Before we speak to our special guest for this episode, here's a quick summary of who we are and what we do. VWO is a leading experience optimization platform. Using our latest product, VWO Insights, you can analyze user journeys and identify conversion roadblocks on your website and mobile app. So without any further delay, let's jump right into the conversation. Hello, listeners and viewers. Welcome to another episode of our CRO Wizards podcast. We are thrilled to welcome Benny Lucas. On our episode today, Benny is the Head of Marketing Technology at Resolution Digital, an acclaimed full-service digital-first agency in Australia. A B2C, B2B digital strategist, Benny is passionate about data and digital technology, boasting a pro proven track record of driving businesses, business success through strategic digital transformation projects. Join us to gain valuable insights from his extensive experience and expertise in digital marketing. Hi, Benny. Welcome to the CRO Wizard series by VW Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Great. Perfect. I've seen your work. Uh, I've been through your profile and the work that you have done is really great so far, especially, uh, you know, the work that the agency has been doing, uh, right? I think it's fantastic. Uh, we need such, you know, many more organizations like this that can basically help uh, increase the awareness about CRO, uh, right? Uh, especially in the APAC market. So, so you know, glad to have you on this podcast. Thank you so much. Yeah, we're doing a lot of great work in, in the CRO space and with yourselves at VWO, we're really pushing the boundaries of um, the, the expectations from clients and driving results, you know, dwindling budgets in, in some of the economic headwinds that we're, that we're facing. Okay. So how do we make the best use of the budgets available to marketing teams and, and IT teams? Um, right. And using tools like VWO, it's been it's been really successful in driving those results. Great, glad glad to know that, Benny. So, uh, is there anything in interesting you're working on this week? Ah, uh, it doesn't stop really. Um, we've got a lot of projects happening, which is is great. Um, great. I think there was a period where um, you know it was it was hard to find opportunities, and right now we're just bustling with with opportunities, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Looking at big um, transformation or evolution projects. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot. A lot of good things happening, lots of different technologies that are being um, talked about and spoken about. And, um, you know, optimization is a key kind of output from, from some of those big pieces of work. Great, great. Perfect. Uh, so uh, what's, uh, you know, any recent development or trend in CRO that has caught your attention? Um, I think the, the, the use of marketing automation specifically in hmm. optimization and the way that we start to think about optimization, um, you know, with, with our clients is we're really focusing now on omni-channel optimization. So um, historically, our CRO and A-B testing efforts have been focused on web um, and sometimes app. We're now really focused on the channel. We know consumers um, and, and customers of our clients are 
interacting with brands in more ways than ever before. Um, right. So whether that be across their website or it be on their app, could be email, SMS, push notifications. Hmm. Where are those areas where we can really intercept um, and optimize that messaging and that strategy to ensure that we're driving impact uh, for our clients? So omni-channel, a big focus. Um, the other thing that we look at is um, what we use is our evolution framework. Um, and when I speak to evolution, you know, a lot of companies think of these big digital transformation projects and right. we want to do a big digital transformation, but quite often and quite often that's not realistic. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why is it's usually a big endeavor. We're talking about throwing out everything and bringing in everything new, a right. lot of change management required. So what we look to do is our evolution framework with our clients. And typically that, that involves three stages. So maximize, adapt, evolve. And we look at optimization and personalization as part of that. So maximize being what are the areas where we can start to maximize what we're currently doing and start to run some quick tests. Mm -hmm. Moving into adapt, we start to adapt um, the, the sophistication of the techniques that we may be doing in optimization and personalization. And evolution, we're thinking really blue skies. So how do we leverage a CDP, very critical audiences, you know, using ML and AI to then find the right um, I guess, ways of then predicting or different modeling to then do really advanced CRO uh, and personalization efforts. So they're kind of the two big things that we're talking to uh, clients and trends that we're kind of pushing towards mm -hmm. is omni-channel and, and ensuring that we've got that sort of evolution framework powering that as well. Fair enough. Uh, I really li like this approach of the focus, especially on omni-channel, right? Because even though there are a lot of CRO teams, uh, you know, in companies, they are trying to increase the conversion rate, but I think that kind of deviates them from their omni-channel approach that they should be following as well because you are getting, you know, your customers from different channels and you need to have, an, uh, you know, and give an equal attention to all these channels to make sure that these channels are also getting a personalized message uh, from your brand and they, 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 you know, they get the value that you're looking from your website, right? Absolutely. So I believe this has to be a strong focus point for all the CRO experts who are trying to, you know, optimize. Web Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. Great. So uh, when in your current role, how do you leverage marketing optimization to optimize conversion rates uh, across different uh, client campaigns? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question. Marketing, the, the, the term marketing automation in terms of definition, how we would really speak to that. Mm -hmm. um, it's all about really streamlining and enhancing that campaign effectiveness. So we use um, marketing automation um, to really optimize that entire customer journey, thinking about omni-channel again. How do we use marketing automation to drive scale um, to allow us to do this um, you know, with quite lean teams um, and deliver the results that we're, we're hoping to achieve? So we know that each user for, or, or customer or consumer, they're very unique. Um, and there are, so, there are so many different data points out there and potential journeys that you could potentially run as part of your testing framework or, or kind of personalization. Um, but we know that we need to prioritize and focus on those personalizing catered moments that really best meet those user needs and at the times that it needs to happen. Um, so marketing automation is really vitally important um, at each of those stages of optimization and personalization from data analysis and, and insights and user scoring, profiling, prioritization, um, all the way through to like personalized campaigns tailored content and those user journeys. Um, we know that using market automation, there's a lot of efficiencies um, in both team and, and process, and we can focus our resource into those really high value, high impact opportunities. Um, and we use tools like VWO, um, a really great example um, at all different stages, um, you know, using that automation through um, data insights. So maybe it's, you know, the heat mapping, um, some of the forms or funnels or session recordings, goals, surveys, those type of bits, um, all the way through to, you know, pushing and cutting edge around AI generated hypotheses. So right. we know we've had clients who are really excited about being able to use AI to come up with ideas on tests and hypotheses to test, um, uh, you know, using things like the WYSIWYG test builder. How do we move away from using UX and UI resource um, to really focus on, um, you know, that automation and driving through um, success with our testing um, and, you know, using things like the smart stats engine as well. So I think using the tools at our disposal to make sure we're driving scales and efficiencies um, to drive and make sure our resources are spending times on those bigger ticket items where um, we do need a lot of brain power to, to really come up with those bigger strategic approaches. 
Fair enough. Totally agree. Especially the point that you mentioned wherein every user is different, right? And their expectations are different. So at least using such tools, you are able to, you know, create those cohorts of those users and then make sure you give them that tailored content, uh, you know, for those specific cohorts. And not just that, uh, when you mentioned, uh, you know, features like heat maps, click maps, session recordings, all of this. So you'll have to have that quantitative and qualitative analysis done before you deliver that personalized content or before you go ahead and test something, uh, you know, for your visitors. So I believe that's a great approach. Uh, and I believe this has to be a mandatory part of your entire personalization or testing process uh, because I believe because CRO is still in nascent stages and, uh, you know, a lot of businesses kind of go with this heuristic approach of just trying to change things rather than doing that data back analysis or uh, trying to understand the users. Uh, and if you, you have that data back, uh, you know, understanding, I believe your personalization camping or your te testing camping, the success rate improves, uh, you know, significantly in that case, right? Absolutely, yeah. The way that we speak about this is turning those hunches or, um, you know, I've got a hunch that this is what's the reason for it to making sure that it's data-driven. So absolutely agree. The quant and the qual, the magic of those two analysis coming together, but also the business insight. You know, no one knows their business better than the clients. Very true. Mapping that all together is where you see the success from from some of these efforts. Very true. Very true. Uh, so, uh, when you have gained experience working with various client profiles throughout your career from established brands to startups, so how does your approach to CRO differ depending on the client's industry or the stage of growth? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question. I think typically whenever we start with any client, we do quite rigorous client assessments to really understand mm -hmm. and assess the client's industry, but also their stage of growth or stage of evolution um, to tailor those CRO strategies. So. Um, I mentioned it before, we use an evolution framework, um, and this is really to look at the maturity of that business in terms of all of the different stages of marketing. We are a full service digital agency. Right. Um, we also do some offline media as well. So I guess it's understanding the evolution where they are in terms of that evolution. Are they quite early in their journey? Hmm. Are they quite mature? Hmm. Um, we use a lot of that to understand what's been done in the past. So typically, you know, quite established brands, um, they may have done CRO or optimization in the past. We don't want to come in blind and not have an understanding of what's been done, what worked, what didn't work. Yes. We want to ensure that we're picking up from what we know to date. So um, getting into the nuts and bolts on um, any historic data um, to then identify further opportunities of optimization and start to refine those testing frameworks, but also um, processes and enhancing or fine tuning some of the processes that they have around CRO and optimization. We work in a variety of different capacities with established brands from doing all of their CRO hmm. um, service, you know, with tools like BWO. Um, there's some engagements where in-house they have a team um, where they want to be able to manage this internally hmm. um, and where they're just purely to help um, provide support, provide the processes, provide additional um, people to their team, essentially, to be able to deliver testing and optimization at scale. Whereas a startup, I mean, this is really exciting and interesting with startups because inherently, certainly a lot of tech startups, innovation and testing is kind of at the core of um, how startups operate. So this idea of being agile and rapid testing, it's very similar in the way that we can start to run optimization tests for these sort of businesses. So how do we run tests at scale um, and, and do kind of these multiple small scale experiments um, to identify effective strategies and move quite quickly at then building those foundations for ongoing kind of um, uh, always on uh, implementations of those um, learnings. Um, industry specific is a good one as well. So mm -hmm. e-commerce, as an example, um, we can really focus on that purchase funnel. Um, and if we've got the right tracking and data in place, it is one of the easiest ways for us to be able to prove the ROI of doing some of the efforts that we're doing here. Um, there's nothing better than being able to speak to a C-suite or to the board about your spending X, but your, your, your return is Y. Um, so being able to link that through and CRO and AB testing in this space, um, when we have that data, it's very, very powerful to demonstrate, you know, you're spending some time and resource on this, but really the results are there clear as day in terms of how that then increases some of the cart value, um, you know, average order value, those sort of things as well. B2B is quite interesting when we think about industry as well. Right. Because... 
B2B is very much around these qualified leads. So how do we use optimization techniques to move from first touch to marketing qualified leads to sales qualified leads, really improve scoring. So a sales team goes, hey, you know what? This lead is qualified and we're ready to have a sales opportunity there. And the, obviously the ROI from those can be quite significant as well. Um, but then when we talk about things like SaaS, right? We're, we're talking about subscription-like industries. Mm. Sometimes it's not necessarily conversion rate optimization. Mm. And where we can use optimization techniques is actually around things like retention and churn. So how do we make sure um, through onboarding or, or churn um, or, or retention, we use strategies to help people stay within that subscription? Um, and it's kind of flipping it on its head in terms of the typical term of CRO hmm. um, and looking at optimization as a whole, as a broader strategy and focusing on KPIs that aren't necessarily conversion-based. Got, Got it. So uh, I strongly also believe uh, in understanding the experience or the history in terms of anyone who has previously done CRO because... If you don't understand that history well, you are doing the same mistakes again that were done previously, right? So it's important to understand what kind of ideas did they run, uh, what what were the landing pages that they focused on, uh, what is it that they were trying to uh, you know improve, what were their uh, success metrics that they were basically focusing on. So I believe these are very crucial, important factors that you 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 really need to deep dive into before starting CRO for any client. Right, so that you you are able to get those winners quickly, rather than just doing you know because there could be clients or uh, you know would be who would have already tested their low hanging fruits, right? But again, if you are testing those same things, it it's kind of waste of time. Rather, you get into more complex tests, functionality based mm. tests, and try to see how that moves the needle, right? Yeah. So I think yeah. it's good to have that understanding, as you said, depending on. With stays the client is in, it's always important to understand that history and, you know, implement your ideas based on that history that uh, they already have. Yeah, absolutely. A, a good example that I can give you here is Torrens University. It's an education mm. client of ours. They use right. VWO as their testing tool. Okay. They also have a more uh, a DXP set up for their website, but the the to in, to actually implement always on personalization is very resource heavy from a dev and UX UI team. Yep. So what we use there is we use VWO as a way of testing hypotheses, proving that out, mm. and then implementing those successful tests as always on personalizations within the DXP platform. So that's how we typically use um, CRO as a way of testing or AB testing to then go, hey, this is really worth doing. It's worth putting the resources behind. And we're seeing much better results off the back of using that kind of handover to an always on implementation. Uh, so many data analysis plays a crucial role in CRO. How do you ensure you're collecting and interpreting the right data points to identify conversion rate bottlenecks of your clients? Yeah, it's a, a great question. Data analysis is key. Uh, we know that um, having the right data in place, um, but then being confident in the data, you know, that it, we can't do our work in terms of successful optimization and A-B testing without this. So um, there's a few different streams that I'd break this down into. Um, the first is really in that data collection stream is ensuring that uh, certainly with those kickoff calls with clients before engaging in a CRO program or an A-B testing optimi optimization program, mm -hmm. we do have we do work with them to understand what are those key performance indicators, those KPIs that are relevant to those business metrics and those client goals. Right. Key, ensuring that we know what are the conversion rates we need to be tracking um, you know, what are some of those other impacts that we need to be aware of? The next step is then ensuring data accuracy. Hmm. Um, you know, without that integrity of data, we're always going to be challenged in terms of what we're coming back to a client with um, and saying what worked or what didn't work. So um, first, the implementation of tracking. Hmm. Um, so we know that having the right tracking codes and tags, whether that be through server-side or client-side tracking is imperative. Um, uh, we at Resolution Digital, we're part of the Omnicom Media Group, so part of a much bigger global conglomerate. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that, we've got a specialized business unit called Tracken, and they are uh, our number one key source of doing anything around analytics and setting up of tracking codes. And we work very closely with them to make sure that the data we're tracking, is hundred, we're hundred percent confident that what we're recording is correct. Um, and as part of that, integrity as well. So, how do we validate and clean that data to ensure accuracy? How do we remove any outliers there or any inconsistencies in the data? 
The next step on analysis is then what we would call more of that data interpretation. So flipping data observations into insights, understanding segmentation, um, breaking that data into meaningful data or meaningful insights to identify specific segments, but also user journey analysis. So how do we start to map out and visualize that user journey and move that from just data input to something visual for a client to understand where those certain drop-offs occur in maybe say an e-commerce funnel or flow. Right. With those drop-offs, you know, there might be those bottlenecks that we need to then really focus on and target on mm. um, and then matching those bottlenecks with our qualitative and quantitative data, making sure we have the right test to then test against those bottlenecks to try and find out ways that we can improve um, the challenges that we're seeing there. I think a real commitment to data-driven optimization is key here, making sure that the team is very meticulous in their approach to, to, to capturing data, interpreting data, storing data is key for any successful CRO or A-B testing optimization program. Great. Uh, I think that's a very detailed explanation of how, uh, you know, the basic analytical process should look like before, you know, running any test. And I believe this gives a lot of insights to our listeners who are basically getting into CRO or trying to understand, uh, you know, how uh, basically your analysis should be done, how the integra uh, the integrity, the interpretation, the storing, all of that plays a crucial uh, role in terms of, you know, do doing that homework that you need to do before getting started, right? Absolutely. So uh, I totally, uh, you know, link to those aspects that you basically mentioned step by step. And I believe it's uh, extremely crucial for each and every CRO expert to make sure that all these pointers are basically well considered before getting into the next steps of running any test on the website. Yeah, yeah. The homework must be done before getting started. Otherwise, you're going to be doing work and, and you're not going to be confident in, in, in the work that you're doing. Exactly. Well said. Uh, so with the growing trend of, uh, you know, cookie-less marketing, how is Re Resolution Digital helping its clients adapt their MarkTech uh, stack to optimize conversions in this evolving privacy landscape? I'm glad you asked because I think it's a, it's a really nice conversation from data is talking about that cookie-less future and we hear about it a lot, right? And right. if anyone who doesn't know, um, there is obviously a big trend growing around this cookie-less future um, and the evolution of privacy in the way that consumers are able to manage and understand their privacy. And you know what? I think it's one of the best things that, that's happening to this industry, although it's getting harder for us to be able to do some of the te techniques and tactics we've been relying on for a long time in digital marketing to be able to track users throughout their digital journeys is getting harder. Um, but in mm -hmm. saying that, it's giving the power back to the people. It's giving people the opportunity to decide when they want to opt in or consent. It's really, really important. Um, so that impact is there. You know, we've got things like GDPR, we've mm -hmm. got CCPA. These are different privacy regulations that are coming through and the browsers as well are making those changes to kind of align and make sure that they are compliant for their users as well. So some of the adaptions we're seeing to the MarTech stack um, we're seeing a massive focus on first-party data as a key thing to be collecting in short, to ensure that um, you know when there are these changes of third-party cookies disappearing, we've got some first-party data there to really back that up. So um, tools such as PRM make a big resurgence, but more importantly, things like CDPs. So that customer data platform um, is, is, is a key technology to really unify and leverage first-party data. Um, and we're, we're seeing... Um, we're even having conversations with clients around what we call composable CDPs, where we're leveraging, um, you know, the data cloud storage that a client may typically use and doing a lot of the unification there uh, and pushing, you know, ETL and reverse ETL in and out of that technology um, to make sure that we can actually utilize some of those first party data segments that we're doing. Another thing to be thinking about, and again, we're tracking our specialized business unit. We're doing a lot of server-side tracking implementation, okay. uh, and that really allows us to bypass some of that reliance on cookies mm. and be able to track events using the server um, in capturing that. So Google Tag Manager, GTM, a lot of people will know of that. Mm. Moving that to a server-side implementation allows us to better collect interactions um, in this privacy-first or cookie-less world. Um, another thing that we're seeing emerge a lot is consent management platforms or CMPs. Another um, an, another kind of abbreviation to be aware of, um, but this is really to allow users to ensure compliance 
on build stuff for vehicles in right. terms of managing the preferences and consent online. Uh, another another part that's critical is the privacy sandbox, which is a another kind of technology, um, a, a way for technology to kind of adapt to this, where we have a privacy safe area to share first party data um, with certain providers um, who can then also enrich certain customer databases to, to do more effective marketing. I think when we think about first party data, it's really critical for the listeners today to think about the value exchange that they're providing their users. So when we think of value exchange, typically you can think of it as a like a, a gated white paper on a website, right? So the value exchange there is I'm giving you my first party data mm-hmm. and the value you're giving me back is that white paper. Correct. What is the value exchange that you as a business or, or, or your client can be giving uh, in order to capture first party data? And this is where innovation is critical to think of what is that value exchange? How do we gamify that first party data collection? Um, it's hard to know from a future point of view what some of the changes may be in the future, mm-hmm. but I'm sure we will continue to see emerging technologies there. Um, and something that, you know, if a listener wants to know more about um, some of the changes happening to the privacy world, right. we do have a, a, a privacy guide on our website, okay. um, which is around privacy, signal loss, and the future of advertising. Um, it's a downloadable asset to, to get on our website. So if that's of interest and or you want to reach out, please do reach out as well. Perfect. Great. Uh, I... Uh... Really like the point when you said the data, uh, you know, the value, the value that you need to get, uh, you know, because it, it, that value really is what defines the success, right? If you aren't getting that value, uh, you know, from uh, the data that you're collecting, that that is basically the end of it. So every business in the end either looks for a value or looks for an ROI. And that is what, uh, you know, uh, as CRO experts, your focus has to be on. And uh, the way you have been managing the entire concept of, you know, collecting cookies, collecting data, uh, I, I think that that that's a good part that you're doing in terms of, you know, having a standard procedure in terms of doing everything. Because this is actually a concern for a lot of CRO experts, uh, you know, globally in terms of uh, how would they manage things in t- if this cookie-less, uh, you know, uh, implementation happening or, uh, clients might have, or users will have to, you know, first accept the cookies because if you're going with that consent-based uh, cookie model, wherein users uh, should, only the data will be tracked when somebody accepts the cookies. Ideally, majority of them do not accept the cookies. They just go through the website. And as a CRO expert, it becomes challenging for me because the traffic on a specific campaign and the test drastically reduces because of that. Right. Absolutely. So the, these are specific challenges that I've noticed as well in terms of you know uh, going through the cookie list or the you know consent based uh, cookie models. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. No, it's good points. Uh, great. Uh, so, how does the resolution digital leverage attribution models to demonstrate the true impact of CRO initiatives over uh, you know on overall client ROI? Yeah. It's it, it, attribution's gotten harder with some of the changes to the cookie-less future. And we're seeing, having a clear understanding on how we attribute um, our digital media, um, but also some of the efforts that we're doing in terms of SEO and CRO and optimization. Um, it's really important to have a clear view on how that is to be planned and managed in the future. So um, attribution models, for anyone who's not very sure, it's all around assigning value to each of those touch points in that customer journey to really understand its contribution to a conversion or to an output, right? So it's about managing and understanding those different interactions and giving them a weighting. So typically some common models here, we talked to first touch, last Mm. touch, linear, um, Mm. there's time decay and position-based models. Mm. um, And they are kind of some of the typical ones. What we've built at Resolution Digital, we've built a a proprietary um, uh, model um, that we use for attribution with our clients, which we call the ROI optimizer. Okay. Um, and essentially, we use a, a couple of different statistical um, algorithms to best understand certain inputs and outputs to then better weight over a seasonal period and over a time period on how effective certain tactics in a marketing landscape is on driving real business results. Um, so there's more information that we can speak to on this um, at another time, but making sure you are clear on the way that you're attributing is very important could then understand ROI on the work that you're doing. But I think equally as important is 
being able to tell the story and be able to report on that story to the business on the work that's being done and be able to visualize that attribution model, uh, visualize the the output of that work um, is also as 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 important. We know that you know some people in the C-suite or senior leadership positions they aren't into the nuts and bolts of the data. How do we bring that back to a very easy to understand um, a, a story or narrative for the business to then understand, hey, this is worth investing in and we should continue or even increase our investment in this space? Very true. Very true. Uh, because, uh, again, it uh, you know gets us back to that value that you're getting uh, you know, by understanding these attributions, right? And for leadership, of course, they do not have enough time to get into all these nuances. Rather, they would want to understand what worked and what did not work. So you will have to get those learnings from each and every test that you run and present those learnings as to what can be improved on the website. And, uh, you know, that storytelling, as you said, the right word, it is not mm. about storytelling and showcasing that, uh, you know, what are those learnings that you are able to get from each on, uh, you know, every camping that you have, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great. Uh, so beyond technical expertise, what personal qualities or skills do you consider most valuable for, uh, you know, success in a leadership role? Yeah, it's it's a good question. I think technical is, is quite often what we hear a lot these days. So bringing some of those non-technical skills are really important, something that I really value in pushing the team to focus on. I think probably first one is really making sure that, uh, you know, as part of leadership, you've got that visionary thinking, mm -hmm. that strategic vision okay. in terms of setting clear strate strategic ideas in terms of where we want to grow, but also inspiring other people in your team to follow that. And when I speak to leadership qualities, it's not just myself as a leader in my team, but yeah. how do I empower every person in the team, no matter how junior they are, to really focus on their own leadership qualities, to manage upwards and make sure that people understand that, hey, I'm a voice and I'm important yeah. here as well. Um, communication, I think, are skills that in a post-COVID-19 world, in a, you know, post-pandemic world, I mean, the, the future of work is here, right? We are remote working we're working in different parts of the world like it's it's no longer a hey this person's in the office and i'm going to go tap them on the shoulder so i think communication is key making sure that not every person is in a meeting if it's not required making sure that not everyone is in that decision making if it's not required so how do we make sure that the right communication is being made with the right people but the same uh in saying that how do we make sure people are informed as needed um, with the amount of detail that they need to be informed with. Another one um, that's probably quite important to me is around specifically emotional intelligence. So, um, you know, we are working in a very high pressure industry. We are doing a lot of work. There's a lot of stress. Mm. Um, how do we ensure that mental health and empathy and understanding is critical um, at, at being thought of when, when we talk to our teams and we start to lead our teams? We know that not everyone's having the best day all the time. Um, there's things that are going on outside of work that do Im impact people. How do we make sure we've got the right room to um, be there to assist and support those people during that time? Um, but also, um, you know, how do we ensure that people are doing that for other people as well? Really important to me um, and within this organization as well. Um, adaptability, how do we make sure that um, we're open to change and we can adapt to any new challenges or, or things coming our way? Um, I guess, problem solving and having that critical thinking lens, also non-technical. Um, how do we jump in a room and really push the boundaries? And I think that kind of leads itself then into probably the last and, and one of the more important ones for the team that I sit in within Resolution Digital, and that's innovation. So how do we make sure we're not just doing things for the sake of doing things? How do we push the boundary and think outside the box? Um, this one that's is, is really important to me that we're continually being curious in the way that we do work in the ways that we that we answer certain challenges um, and really drive that innovation within the business, uh, within the team, uh, and within yourself as well. Great. I, I believe this gives a lot of insights to our aspiring leaders who are basically looking forward to get into that leadership position, especially the the soft skills that you mentioned should uh, that is that is required, not just technical the technical skills, but the other soft skills that you mentioned that play a crucial role in becoming a successful leader. 
uh so uh you know how do you stay up to date on the latest trends and best practices in the field to ensure you're delivering the best results for your clients yeah it's 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 a great question i think continuous learning hmm. is very important and i think this idea that your organization or someone's going to come along and spoon feed you continuous learning is is not the reality and this is where you have to as yourself um take that on um and be someone who's ready to to self learn a lot of that new um learning for 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 yourself and i think we're in a we're in a situation where there's more information at our fingertips than ever Correct. so there's no shortage of learning right there's a lot of content out there there's a lot of videos there's a lot of podcasts like we're on today mm-hmm. for someone to really pick up and start to learn um around um whatever they decide to learn or whether that's um improving their specialized skills or broadening out their skills i guess some of the methods that i would use and 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 ways that i continually learn mm-hmm. um is you know staying up to date with industry publications and blogs okay. so how do i set aside time every day every morning okay. to make sure i'm up to date on what's happening in the industry what are the changes what are the new technology advancements in vwo for example mm-hmm. how do you stay up to date with that and make sure you're very diligent and setting time aside to do that i think you'll find the more you do that um the better conversations that you may have then with with clients with team members with senior staff within your organization to be informed is powerful and dangerous so make sure you stay informed so you can have those conversations i think another key element of that information at your fingertips is webinars and online courses you know we can now certify ourselves without going to a university degree but actually doing these online courses so how do you prove to your organization you're certified in certain technologies you know there's linkedin learning courses right sira and i mean there's there's so many opportunities there to be across that and similar with webinars you know making sure you're understanding client success stories or agency success stories on working with clients and understanding what's worked and what didn't i think another one that's probably a, another one that's kind of post covid and post pandemic is like networking and conferences so you know how do you go and be in person at conferences and events and mm. start to build up your network and go up and talk to people and the amount of times i've spoken to someone at a networking event and then months later years later i've then bumped into them in another walk of life and i'm working with these people or you know they might become your boss or you know you might become managing them it's 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 not a massive industry and there's ways that making sure you're building your network not just on linkedin not just online but building your network in person it's vital and critical to making sure you're building up um that kind of continual learning and understanding the latest trends in the industry i think yourself you as yourself needs to have a commitment to excellence if you want to continue to learn and be a leader in this space and that commitment is to say i'm going to set aside time to improve myself every day um i know that you know in my team on a friday we have a booking a block booking where we have no client calls and it is devoted to continuous self learning and i've seen some of the output and uh, output and replays of this where the teams have gone ahead and done some self learning and then come back to explain to the team what are some of the things that they learned and it's kind of this idea of you know we're all learning together um and it really does help make sure that you've got the experts on your team ready to deliver any against any of the client challenges so it it basically gets uh, you know started with learning so you should take that first step and then get into all the different sources that you might have to collect data be it online offline conferences webinars podcast youtube because as i said uh information is on our fingertips now before the or dot com or burst we did not have all these access to all these uh, you know uh, information but in the last uh, two decades we have been able to you know get that innovation wherein every single uh thing that we need is just a screen away right so it has only made things uh, easier in terms of learning right so totally agree to that uh, uh benny on a lighter note any plans for self care or relaxation after today's recording uh look let's um i think we're going to go do some physical exercise i think that's a, a, a something that i need to do um after a busy day so we'll go to the gym today um yeah. probably try and get out and do a walk i think I think it is raining outside. I haven't been outside a whole lot today. So last I checked it was raining. So we're a bit limited in in some of the things that we can do. But I think, you know, making sure you're switching off. This is what I try to do. Make sure I switch off at the same time every day and and disconnect work from from home life so important. Um so I think yeah, today we'll go to the gym. 
and then we'll probably just sit on the couch and get stuck into some of the new TV shows that are coming out. Fair enough. Yeah. So we'll just now move to the last part of the podcast. So this is basically a rapid fire, fire round. I've got a set of questions. And, okay. uh, let's see what your in- instincts have to say. Yeah. Okay. Great. So if you're starting a career today in Seattle, what is that one thing that you would do differently? One thing I would do differently if I was starting today um, would be to ensure that I've done a lot of the research going into the space. Um, I guess I think I was thrown quite deep into the deep end, hadn't done a lot of the research on what are the right methodologies and processes there. So I think doing a bit more research before getting thrown in. Um, Although I think that it's either a sink or swim in that instance. And I think swimming is what's happening at the moment. Fair enough. Um, Newsletter that every CRO professional must follow. For me, TLDR is a newsletter that I think everyone should follow. Okay. Um, TLDR has a lot of advancements in not just CRO, but um, technology as a broader ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Um, would really recommend checking that one out. All right. Well, three books that you would recommend to our listeners? Three books. Um, the 48 Laws of Power is a book that I love. Okay. Um, that speaks a lot around the uh, the political nature of, of working in corporate. Okay. Um, they're probably... I can't think of any of the top of my head now that you, you put me on the spot. But 48 Laws of Power, I think, is one that you should definitely be reading. Great. Uh, uh, what's your go-to travel destination in Australia? Go-to travel destination in Australia? Yep. Probably would need to be um, the Gold Coast, I think. The Gold Coast is awesome. It's so beautiful. The sun is always great. More specifically, the Whit Sundays a bit further north is is even more more beautiful to me. Lots of nice yachting. Um, there's a lot of nice diving, scuba diving um, opportunities there. Uh, it's beautiful. All right. Uh, one thing that AI will replace in the next three years? AI will replace a lot of the mundane, tedious tasks that mm. teams you do. Um, I think I'm really excited for AI to be able to take away from the, the, the low effort work and give people the flexibility to really focus on the bigger things that matter and where more brain power is needed. All right. Uh, if not a CRO specialist, what other profession would you have chosen? It's a hard one. I think, look, when I was growing up, I always wanted to get into the music industry. I'm not much of an artist myself, but, yeah. um, you know, whether that be managing artists um, or, you know, doing some kind of record producing or something like that, mm-hmm. I think that would probably be the, the, the way I was going to go. I was always looking at the IT space as well, but yeah. I found a nice little middle ground in that marketing and technology and optimization area. All right. Uh, one CRO metric that you wish people would stop obsessing over? Uh, sometimes conversion rate, in my opinion. I think, uh, you know, there's there's different KPIs to be thinking about. Um, right. Sometimes it's understanding customer satisfaction, mm-hmm. retention, mm-hmm. churn. Mm-hmm. It's not all about conversion necessarily. And that's why we speak to optimization um, and we're moving away from the term CRO specifically. All right. Uh, a dream or a goal that you wish to achieve in the next three years? Uh, probably to work um, work overseas is a goal that I think I'm looking to achieve. I think being part of Omnicom as a group, a bigger group, there's opportunities abroad. Um, so being part of a bigger team and seeing it from another side outside of Australia could be something that um, I'd like to achieve. Good, perfect. I think these were the goals questions that I had uh, so but it has been a pleasure hosting you Benny on the call the uh, the conversation was really insightful and I think it also adds a lot of value to our listeners who who are currently in the CRO space and also to listeners who are trying to get into the CRO space right especially the nuances uh, of you know doing the analytics part in terms of the cookie less marketing uh, uh, in terms of the processes that you follow internally to uh, you know provide that experience to all the kinds of businesses, be it startups or be it, uh, you know, enterprise level clients. I think these, uh, uh, you know, pointers that you shared really are, add a lot of value and it has been a great conversation and I look forward to, uh, you know, having much more, uh, many more sessions with you in the future. Yeah. Sounds great. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks, buddy. Thanks for your time. Take care.